A flash of red in the green, grey Australian bush is always exciting. There are crimson rosellas, mistletoe birds, which are red, but the most exciting of all are the red robins. In Australia, we have half a dozen red robins. Some of these are more pink and some have a little bit of orange. But if you want to see a real red robin, the one that comes hop hop hopping along, look no further than the red cap robin and the scarlet robin. For both of these are true robin redbreast. The red robins of Australia belong to the genus Petroica, which really means Petros rock, Oica, home, or rock home, as these birds sit on a perch or a rock, waiting to pounce on some prey moving on the ground, often called perch and prey birds. Most countries throughout the world have a bird that they call a red robin. And historically, all these robins throughout the world were placed into the family Muscicarpa, Musca for fly, carpa for chase or fly catchers. Over time, we now have better classification of these birds in their taxonomic positions. The northern hemisphere birds are more of a thrush. And the Australian Oceana robins are quite separate and in their own family, Petroicidae. Here is a flame robin. Beautiful chest. Not quite as scarlet, a hint of orange. But the coverage over the breast and belly is the greatest red colour of all the Australian robins. The binomial name for the flame robin is Petroica phoenicia, from the Latin meaning the bird with a rock home that's coloured red. All robins are woodland birds and woodland birds are diminishing in numbers. Now in the 21st century, with loss of habitat, the flame robin is the most threatened of all the Australian robins. Did you notice the white marking just above the bill on the forehead? The forehead or fronds is often marked in robins. It is largest in the male scarlet. The flame robin has a fairly large fronds as well. But the fronds is absent in the red capped robin. And those robins with the fronds, it is larger in the male. With the Australian Petroica, we have two robins that aren't red but pink. And here is the rose robin. Just as a reminder that not all robins are red, here is a review of the Australian robins. Look at these, yellow, yellow and white, pinkish over the fronds, black and white, pied colours. This is the hooded robin. The hooded and the red cap robin are the robins of the drier areas of Australia. A white browed robin. Here's a tropical robin, and the tropical robins don't show the sexual dimorphism of the red robins. The buff-sided robin, very similar to the white brow, but has a buff on the side. Another large robin from the tropics, this is the grey-headed robin. Jackie Winter, a grey robin with brownish wings. And for details, see the Jackie Winter video, the white-breasted robin from WA. Then there are the fly robins, like the yellow-bellied flycatcher, that feed more on the wing. Lastly, the yellow robins, the eastern and western yellow robin. Now this video is about the red robins, and look at this beautiful bird. This is the scarlet robin, absolutely spectacular. A male with a large white fronds. And now the red cat, look at him, sitting on a perch, just looking at the ground. When he flies off, there is white and black under the wing. A pair of red caps in flight, such beautiful birds. They sit on a perch, they sit on a rock, looking at the ground, ready to sally waiting for the movement, ready to pounce. Red robins observe from a low perch or a rock. The red cap robin inhabits the drier parts of Australia and whenever we go photographing for them, the sweat and the dust make one's body feel as though it's covered in mud. The habitat is in the open woodland of these drier areas, always associated with understory, where it spends most of its time. Sexual dimorphism is present in all of the red robins of Australia. And here is a female red cap. The cap is now no more than a rouge blush. And the scarlet chest has paled into an insignificant pale fawn. Despite this, the male still thinks she is most attractive and keeps her regular eye on what she is doing. 
Assessing the maturity of a red cap robin is not easy. When they're a full-blown male, one can be certain, but the young tend to look like the females. In the first year, the birds look more ruffled. And it's not until the first molt that the males take on a little bit of coloration. Look at this male having a bath. It's got a reasonably bright cap and a little bit of pink blush on the chest. This is a male, not a full-blown male, but immature. It's stated that the robins don't come into full maturity until after the second molt, but they can breed after the first molt. Here we have a red cap robin. We would probably say it's a female. It has the red cap, no pink on the chest, but the bird has a ruffled appearance and there is a degree, only a small one, of pin striping as the quills can still be seen. This is a young bird. I cannot determine whether it's male or female. Here, a fledgling, begging for food. The origin of the name Robin is interesting. It is probably Germanic in origin, coming from the name Robert, which really means outstanding. And I think historically, this name was attributed to the Red Robins of Europe. The Robins of Australia are more carnivorous than the Northern Hemisphere Robin Redbreasts. Though North and South birds eat insects and arachnids, the Southern birds of Australia rarely eat seed. I would like to quickly show you some of the habitat. This is in the northern tablelands of New South Wales, where both red-capped and scarlet robins were present. Firstly, at this water point, you can see the understory, the scrub, with a good tree canopy above. This is the habitat of the scarlet robin, and there were several families in close vicinity here. Marsupials and monotremes also like this area, and you'll notice that there is a lot of wood on the ground. This is what the scarlet robin likes. Another water point, again, in the central tablelands, not far away from the previous waterhole. And here, this is a favourite site for the red cap robin. Other bird watchers were also about. In Christian folklore regarding the crucifixion and the birth of Christ, there are several birds that take a significant role. For instance, the nightingale singing with the heavenly host at the birth of Christ. At the crucifixion, there are several very good bird stories. Though these may be apocryphal, they make very interesting reading for birders. The first is the story of the crossbill. This is at the Northern Hemisphere bird, so we don't see it in Australia. But the legend goes that the crossbill got its bill crossed as it perched on the cross and tried to extract the nails out of the hands of the crucified Jesus. Well, what about robins? They are the most spectacular of birds. The story of the robin at the crucifixion of Jesus is documented by Alice Parmeli. The origin of the story is uncertain, but I strongly suspect that Francis of Assisi was one who was responsible. Young Francis was born to wealthy parents, and Francis was a popular young man, always dressing in the finest clothes and going with the finest friends. He was a troubadour. His mother was a silk weaver and his father, the merchant, travelling, selling the silkwares. The plan was that Francis would become a merchant in the family business, but fate determined instead that he would go into the army. He did this rather reluctantly, not making a good soldier. It wasn't long before he was captured. He was released several years later, and he returned back into the family business. Something had changed in the young Francis. One day, as he was trying to sell the silks, a beggar came up who was naked. The next thing is... Francis clothed him with the finest silks and sent him on his way. And from that moment on, Francis plunged after poverty as some men would dig for gold. He was chastised time and again from his parents and the church hierarchy for being wasteful with his father's goods. For a time, Francis tried to change his ways. His parents thought he was going to settle down and marry, for he had met a beautiful girl. Then, one moonlit night, when Francis was by himself, he picked up a stick, drawing in the snow a figure of a man and a woman and they were holding hands with children. Francis was contemplating marriage, settling down and becoming a responsible citizen. But the snow melted, and Francis let his dreams of domestic bliss fade with it. Instead, he followed the calling that God had given to him, 
to become a missionary, dedicating his life to the Gospels. Francis was not very good at preaching, so he went to the forest and preached to the animals, and there in creation found purposeful meaning for his life. And so from Francis's preaching to the animals, many stories developed, and the one that I did like was the one of the robin. So at the crucifixion, the robin came and sat on the crown of thorns, trying to remove it from the head of Christ. But one of the thorns smeared with the blood of Christ pierced it on the breast, staining the feathers. And this is the story of the robin redbreast. You may say that this doesn't really apply to the Australian robins because it comes from Western Europe. However, when you look at the Western European robins, they don't have the scarlet chest. They are more rusty. Now look at this beautiful scarlet robin. He is really the robin redbreast with a red breast equivalent to that that could be stained by the blood of Christ. And I suspect it was Francis of Assisi that first gave this idea. Robins tend to feed in the mornings. And this is when you will find the red cap and the scarlet robin on the ground looking for insects. In contrast, the rose robin spends considerable time doing the same thing in the high canopy. This is why the rose robin likes forests that are a little bit more dense than either the red cap or the scarlet. Here is the rear view of a scarlet robin. It looks just black and white. Now a hooded robin. As it turns you can see there is no blood staining red on the chest. For the hooded robin is a pied coloured only bird. But from the rear view it is easily confused with the red robins. The scarlet robin comes up into higher altitudes as it gets warmer. Here we are at approximately 800 metres above sea level. Here the scarlet robins are breeding. Once again with the immature birds it's hard to determine the sex. Often we will say it's a female, but if you look and find ruffled feathers it just tells us that this is an immature bird of indeterminate sex. The descriptive features of the robins are that they have stocky bodies with matchstick thin legs. As we said at the beginning, this video is about Petroica, the red-breasted robins of Australia, or robin redbreast. The northern hemisphere robin redbreasts have got a touch of rusty colour. The robins we've looked at so far, the scarlet and the red cat robin, have got a true scarlet chest. But not all the Australian robins of the family Petroica have got a scarlet chest. We have several birds that have got pink coloration. And here is one. This is the rose robin. The rose robin has a very narrow fronds, in contrast to the scarlet. Now the petroica that we've looked at so far feed mostly at the ground or just above it on the shrubs, but the rose robin is a very high canopy feeder, so photographing him is rather difficult. So what we've done is photographed mostly on the ground at a water point when the bird comes to drink. And the rose robin, just like the other Petroica, exhibits sexual dimorphism. The male has a rich rose pink chest, the female a pale pink blush. Juveniles also have the aloe melanin or the rusty brown colour and lack the significant colour on the chest. Sometimes there is a faint pink, this may suggest it's more of a male, but again it's hard to distinguish the male juvenile from the female. To finish with the Petroica, we will leave you with these clips of the female Rose Robin. On behalf of Plumes of Oz, thank you for joining us in looking at this video on the Petroica and the Robin Redbreast. 
If you would like to subscribe to this channel, just click on the P and you'll be notified of our next Australian wildlife bird video.